when it's been seven years for uh, since the last game in a, in a popular series came out, usually fans are kind of eager to get it out there. But then again, with Europa Universalis 3, you never really stopped working on it and you always gave players new content. So when this game was announced, some of the fans were like, but Europa Universalis is the complete game. So how do you, what, 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 sort of, what sort of motivations do you have when you're going into uh, the development of, of this game? Yeah, for this game, I think that, I mean, for us too, I mean, the, the Europa Universalis 3, the series is, is approaching something called the complete game. But, but I mean, we've been doing expansions now for five, seven years or something that, and we, we add features and, and some of the features we really like, some of them perhaps we don't like as much. But, but the thing is that the game is getting kind of cramped, right? You have a limited amount of interfaces, you have a certain amount of game systems, and you wonder where should, okay, we have this new icon and, and value we should put somewhere. Where should we put it? Well, in here somewhere. And now this is the combined religious politic uh, rebel screen or something. And uh, I mean, so we figure that, you know, this needs, we need to take a close look at all these features. And, you know, why do we think this is such a great game? And which, which stuff doesn't really fit in there? And, and what could we make easier to understand? Not le less, least, l not less complex, but easier to understand. And, and also, we've, we've done uh, lots of games since then. I mean, we've done Crusader Kings 2 and Heart Warrior 3 and these kind of games. And we, we've improved our engine quite a lot. And, and the core, and we've learned so much about development. So we figured that, I mean, this is the time to come back to, to you know, really our favorite franchise, or my favorite franchise anyway, mm. and sort of take a complete, take a step back, look at what do we have, what do we want to do, and make a completely new game. Mm. Looking at it, uh, it feels like maybe the Monarchs is something that you've sort of lifted from Crusader Kings maybe a little bit, like the concept of that, that you've expanded on that. W w is that a correct assessment? Well, I, I think that yes and no, because what we've done, we looked at Crusader Kings 2, is we've gotten inspiration to, you know, th there are some certain things in Crusader Kings 2 that really went well, and I mean it is a great game. And and one of the things is like that, that characters give you connection to the game, right? It gives you, you know, you think about Britain, you think about Elizabeth I, or you think about Sweden during the Thirty Years' War. You have Gustavus Adolphus, mm -hmm. and you have you know strong characters that really shapes how we look at history. But you also have this other thing about ebb and flow, is that. You know, in Crusader Kings 2, you would have a character that conquered lots of land, and then he dies, and then he, you have his son, and all of a sudden your brothers that were your allies five seconds ago mm. are now your competitors. And while this is still EU, right, uh, it's a game about countries and empire building and painting your map. It's not a game about building your family, right? Mm. Uh, we wanted to get a bit of these features into what we're doing. so. Uh, we created this system with monarch power. So the monarchs are fairly similar to what they were in EU3. But what they do with their stats is that they, they have power, right? You have diplomatic power, you have military power, you have administrative power. And these powers really go into every facet of the game. And this is really going to be a game changer. Uh, because, I mean, you use them for small decisions like assaulting fortresses or buying a core. You use them for big decisions like buying technology and... and uh, natural ideas and these kind of things and and this is going to create th this sort of situation where you have like this this great military ruler who creates a military empire by you know forming the army and these kind of things and then he dies and in comes this guy who is either a complete idiot right or or he's maybe good at something else he's good at administrative and you have the empire you built you have the army but the strengths you've built on to create your empire is no longer your formal strength. Your strength is now administrative instead. Mm. And you have to look at the game and change your tactic. Do you have to defend because you're, you're weaker now, you have less mo flexibility? Or can you sort of stop being like the regressive power and conquer all your neighbors and, and sort of change direction and conquer something else? And we think this is gonna try to keep you interested across the game instead of this that many strategy games fall into where mm. you know you have a few really fun critical battles that you won and you build on your strengths and then you realize that okay i've become really good at pressing this button i will keep pressing this button until the game is actually over so i can just see the end game screen yeah so uh another thing that you're talking about that's uh, that's uh, a major change since the last game is is the trade routes and and how trade functions and and sort of how the player wants to sort of i guess um, push his influence on trade um 
Can you tell, talk us through how that works? Well, the trade system was really, first of all, like in, in EU3, it was a system that we weren't completely happy with. Mm -hmm. It was like a bit disconnected with the system. You sent in merchants and you paid money to send them, but you weren't really sure if they were going to do anything. or we just going to you know, lose money from trading. So instead, we, we went ahead and created a completely new system with like trade routes that flow all over the world. And sorry, as the player, you... Uh, you can uh, you can want to project power into these various trade nodes, and your objective with this is to steer the trade flow back to where you live. Mm. Uh, and the interesting part of this is th that as you start the game, suppose you're in Europe, right, and you want to control trade in the Mediterranean, uh, you're going to have like the Asian trade coming in, but you're not really interested in that. You just see lots of money coming in, and and you have certain nodes in the trade network where you project power, you control strategic points, you send fleets to control the sea lanes and you send your merchants to, to go to work there, and you can steer trade in your direction, so you get the money. But then, you know, the game progresses. I mean, European results is about more than controlling strategic points about exploration, for example. So somebody can find the route to Africa, find different nodes, and steer the trade in different directions. And you then need to respond to that and project your power in other places. And, and the game sort of, the trade system becomes a really integrated part with the rest of the game, and we think that it's going to be way more interesting to play this trade focus nations. Mm. You briefly moving back you you mentioned that Euro Europa Universal was your personal favorite sort of game. Uh, could you just uh, highlight a little bit about what it is about the, the time period and about this setting that you that you like? Well, I think first of all, I mean it was the first paradox game I played before mm. I started working here and so so I have it has a special place for me. It's your first love. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but 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 also I think the time period is really interesting because it's so so much happened right. You start the time period with a very fractured Europe. Uh, you, I mean, fr the French king is really weak. The Spain is two countries. Germany is really fractured. Uh, the Ottomans is on the verge of their great expansion. You know, and and Europe Europeans will soon try to to push out across the Atlantic or push around Africa and find new places. And when the period starts, you have this this fractured warlike fairly provincial mess and when you end the period you have this huge global spanning empire and it's such a dynamic period i mean another interesting example like the reformation for example is that a game of eu is going to be like you know what the world is you get control over things you find allies you conquer territories maybe you stabilize things but all, all of a sudden something pops up like these protestants keep spreading about you know they keep making rebellions some of your former allies are suddenly protestants so they hate you and also the dynamics comes back, and there is so much you know, dynamics. I think it's really the, the thing that comes with this period. So much happened, and so it's just such fun to give it, make it into a game. Mm. And and you mentioned how you enjoy playing the game in multiplayer at the office, and that really you want to evolve multiplayer so that it's easier to sort of access and get that sort of fun, that multiplayer fun that you're enjoying, but that can sometimes be a bit tricky to, to find for the player. Yeah, uh, we, we, we want to, because I mean, there's a lot of multiplayer going on in the office and we think this is our best multiplayer game. But, but we, I mean, we haven't really focused on the technical side of the multiplayer mm -hmm. thing. I mean, it works, we have 32 players, you can do play against each other or cooperatively or these things like. But we want to add a couple of new features that we're going to try to do a hot join and we're going to try to improve our matchmaking server and, and have a, like maybe a standalone server and really take a hard look at the whole way from how you find people to play with to how you start your multiplayer game to how you maintain it and run it mm. and, and just make it about the game. You want to play a game in Europe and you sh there shouldn't be any like annoying technical things to get there and that's really our goal with that. Mm. And you don't have to sort of create your own LAN party and play it. Yeah, exactly. Or, you know, decide weeks in advance that you, you know, have to scratch together your most important friends to, to and everybody has to promise to commit the time, right? So uh, where are you at in development right now and, and sort of what's the time plan ahead? Well, uh, we're, we're in fairly early alpha, but, but at the moment we really like how the, the game is shaping up. I mean, uh, we we have like if just a couple of more interfaces really so we can actually play the game in the office with, with like all the features in and then we're gonna try to iterate in these features and, and some of the features aren't completely done but the game is gonna be playable then uh, but I mean of course there's lots of work left mm. uh, and uh, we, we hope to get into alpha uh, this winter or, or late fall uh, and then we're looking at the release 
uh, Q3 2013. But uh, I just want to say that we feel like with Crusade Kings 2, we really set a new standard for Paradox when it comes to quality in a game. And we, we, we really, for this release, we're going to keep that. So if the game is not done by then, it probably will be though, but then we, we have no problem with delaying it a bit more because this is going to be the best Paradox game yet. And then you'll release expansions for seven years. <laughs> well, quite possibly, because <laughs> I, you know, I, I like this idea with expansions, because you, you, know, you, pour, you pull your heart and soul into a game, and you, you, you live and breathe it, and, and the game becomes done, and then you start playing it, and then you realize that, oh, I want to have this feature as well, and I want to have this feature. And I mean, the expansion model really lets you continue, it lets you continue building your sandcastle, and because, I mean, th this is your pet project, right? And if we just sold the game in a box and, and delivered it, we would want to keep working at it, but we would also need to feed our families, right? <laughs> so now we can, and, and also we have, like, the CK2 model where you have, like, we, we have lots of free content f that is financed by by the DLCs, really. So we, we can actually finance project and I think that you know if people play a game that they want to keep playing you don't buy DLCs for a game that you think that I'm gonna play it for a while now unless I get new content then they will probably stop playing it and not buy the content but if they look at this game and think this this is an awesome game I'm gonna keep playing this for a long time they have no problem with like you know putting some more money into it then so I think that the, the free stuff and, and the, the DLCs really mesh each other and really complement each other so Yes, we will keep doing DLCs. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.